Thank you very much, Mary. Es un placer estar aquí con ustedes. Thank you very much for inviting me to Canada. Uh, Elena and I, my partner, and I often think about moving up here, but we're going to stick it out and, and fight neoliberalism back at home. Now, I'm going to start my lecture today with a photograph of my corn. Maybe we ought to get the lights down a bit if we can. I really want you to see this color. This is the corn that we grew on our ranch in Colorado this past summer. What's important about this corn to me is that it, it took about 13 different people, neighbors primarily, to bring it to harvest. And in fact, my father had just died the week before the corn was harvested back in September, so I couldn't be there. All my neighbors were very concerned about the corn. And so they took it upon themselves to bring in the harvest. And uh, no fewer than a dozen people participated in planting, cultivating, and harvesting the seed corn, which we're all going to share next year, or I should say this year. What's important about that is that it indicates to me a concept of the commons. And very importantly, not the commons necessarily as, as a common pool resource, common property resource, the, usually, the usual way that we think about the commons, but rather the commons as a set of social relationships and a set of mutual reliance interests that guide those relationships. This will be at the heart of my talk today on transnational placemaking, food justice, and autonomy. And you can see this in the next photograph on our ranch where my partner Elaine and a couple of students are helping out with the cultivation of the corn that we planted. And again, the point being that it's not just a common property, but rather a whole set of mutual aid and cooperative labor relationships that are at the heart of the commons. So this lecture is as much about the commons, the enclosure and the restoration of the commons, as it is about transnationalism and globalization. The original idea for this lecture came out of my critique of Aryu Napadurai's work, as well as the work of uh, Hart and Negri in Multitude. Both of these are arguments about globalization and empire as deterritorialization. But to me, the end of the local sounds eerily like the end of history. And so I have, in my own work over the years, been documenting the way in which people, even when displaced, re inhabit place, re-inhabit space. And so the two cases that I'm going to present today will illustrate that in a very profound manner because one of them involves, the first case involves the South Central Farmers Feeding Families, which ran the, lar I show you this photograph because this is one of the South Central Farmers uh, sharing beans. He wanted to give me beans. He said, keep this seed. He wanted to give me the seed to plant. The South Central Farmers Feeding Family is a very interesting example of the struggle for the resurgence and restoration of the commons because it is an organization primarily composed of indigenous Mesoamericans who are part of a new post-NAFTA diaspora. A lot of people don't realize this, but since NAFTA, hundreds of thousands of indigenous people from Mexico have been migrating into the United States. In fact, all the way up to Alaska where they're working on in the canneries and on fishing boats. And in fact, there are a quarter million Sapoteks in the Los Angeles basin itself. And so the South Central farmers represent, like the face of this young Triki child, represented 15 different Mesoamerican indigenous peoples who had migrated from Mexico as part of a diaspora into the Los Angeles area and basically created what was the largest urban farm in the United States at 14 acres. And they restored a commons right smack dab in the middle of Watts. The other example or case that I'm going to talk about today is very different from this one, but no less profound. And it involves multi-generational indigenous farmers, acequia farmers, in South Central Colorado, San Luis Valley. This is where my farm is as well. And these are farmers of mixed indigenous and Mexican origin who have been farming on the same land for six to ten generations and even longer. And they too have been battling to restore the commons because in 1960 their land grant commons, their ejido, was enclosed by the direct descendant of President Zachary Taylor who privatized it. In 2002, and I'll give you the details later, the Colorado Supreme Court in 
an extraordinary ruling said that even though this was privately owned, it was subject to the use rights of the original settlers, heirs, and descendants, and successors. And so we have a case here of an 80,000 acre privately owned former common lands that has been restored to common use. So everywhere we're beginning to see cracks in the neoliberal empire as people recapture and restore not just the commons as a space and as a place, but as a set of social relationships as well. Before I get into this, two cases, I want to emphasize something that I think is of extraordinary importance. When you look around the world, wherever you have biodiversity hotspots, you will also have indigenous homelands, so that biological and cultural diversity really go hand in hand. They're inseparable. I don't think this is accidental. I don't think it's a coincidence that the biodiversity hotspots are also the cultural diversity hotspots or indigenous homelands around the world. And that in fact, it is the place-based ecological knowledge of indigenous peoples that have shepherded and nurtured this biodiversity against the odds of a modernizing, globalizing world. In 1991, right before the Rodney King uh, riots or insurrection, and they insisted that this land be made available for community use. After the Rodney King insurrection, the city and county valley decided, well, we better do something about that area because it's, a, it's gonna explode again. And they decided working with the regional food bank to create the, south, the, uh, the farm, the, the urban garden. But it was originally run by the regional food bank. And the regional food bank is really a playground for elites to do their duty, to do their philanthropy. And they were running the garden in a very oppressive way. And the South Central Farmers organized all the discontented indigenous people and other members of the, of the gardening community. And there were some very interesting battles. For example, the regional food bank wanted to divide all of the plots, 350 of them, using this kind of chicken wire. The local people, the indigenous people, wanted to use cactus fences. They wanted an edible landscape so that instead of separating from their neighbors, their neighbors could come and eat their fence. <laughs> this is a very subversive way in which people have an alternative epistemology of place. And it's really captured in this opposition between chicken wire and nopales as fencing. And in fact, you can see here very clearly you have the fence, and now a new fence is emerging made out of nopales. And some of the fencing had been taken down by the time um, that I was doing these photographs. Many people were, were, were taking the fences down because they had grown their, their nopal fences, their edible landscape fencing was in place. The gardening played a major role, I should say, the Sasuke farmers played a major role not only in Southern California politics, but they became actually an uh, icon, a galvanizing group for the global movement for environmental justice and food sovereignty. And in fact, once the threat of eviction began in 19, uh, excuse me, 2006, they received global support from activists and NGOs, indigenous organizations from all over the planet. We were getting letters of support from Kenya, from Japan, from Germany, from Finland, from uh, all over Latin America. It was really rather amazing. Uh, one of the things about the way they approach this is that they make a very important distinction between food security and food sovereignty. Now, food security, according to the UN definition and according to the USDA, U.S. Department of Agriculture, is simply the absence of hunger. That's food security. Mm. But you can be eating a, a supersized McDonald's kind of diet and be food secure.